Okay, so I want to take this opportunity once again to welcome all of you who are already on board. So our webinar today, that is a series two of our webinar. So first and foremost, your excellencies, all protocols observed, distinguished participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Mushane Mushai. I'm a senior lecturer uh, that is in wildlife section of the Department of Clinical Studies, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, University of Nairobi. So I teach wildlife mainly, wildlife management and conservation. So I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our webinar today, titled Engaging Citizen Scientists in Macro Fungi Research and Conservation. So this webinar and also the project is organized by the National Museums of Kenya in partnership with the University of Nairobi. And also the activity has been funded part by a grant from the National Geographical Society. In this virtual conference room, I can recognize some familiar names of our participants from government, NGOs, CBOs, and even private sector. We are very happy to see you here. I would like first and foremost now to introduce today's guests and also our presenters. So our guest of honor is Dr. Teresa Rionando. He, she is the director of citizen scientist, I mean citizen, citizen science and uh, special program uh, projects at the National Geographical Society. We are also very pleased to have Dr. Carlos Beransko. He is also from the National Geographical Society. So Dr. Carlos has a vast experience in uh, eye naturalist tools, which he is going to share with us today. Welcome, Carlos, Dr. Carlos. We also have, uh, I want to introduce to you, Dr. Mary Nwera. She is a senior research scientist at the National Museums of Kenya. She has a lot of experience and has done a lot, especially in uh, both macro and microfungi, and especially ectomycorrhizal uh, fungi. Again, she's going to present to us today. Welcome, Dr. Tari. We also have uh, Susan Kafashia. She is a research scientist at the National Museums of Kenya, the mycology section. Again, she is an expert, especially in macrofungi, particularly mushrooms, and also in the area of mushroom farming and cultivation. Welcome also, Susan Kafashia. So in addition, we have our host. This webinar is hosted by the University of Nairobi. I in particular recognize uh, our host, Nicholas Owino, who is the head of the ICT department. Thank you very much for the support, Mr. Owino. So the goal of this webinar is to create awareness of the importance of macrofungi in our ecosystem. So with the aim of developing interest, particularly, and also knowledge and skills of our scientists, and our uh, lecturers and our citizen scientists to effectively and accurately, first and foremost, submit and identify macrofungi species in the iNaturalist online repository. And uh, also to be able to manage or to uh, develop interest for research, management, and conservation of macrofungi or all fungi uh, species. And also, interest to be able to sustainably utilize these macrofungi species for improved uh, livelihoods. 
So we had uh, two webinar or series. So we conducted one around uh, on 20th August, that is uh, two weeks ago, Friday. So then for those maybe who are not there and even to just recap, we introduced the role of citizen scientists in mushroom research and conservation. We also demonstrated simple, simple methods of mushrooms data collection that are available, especially for uh, citizen scientists. Again, in the same webinar, the first cell is we introduced iNaturalist tools for data submission and identification. And we also introduced both in situ and ex situ uh, methods that are applicable, especially in uh, mushroom management and conservation, which can be used by our citizen scientists, but also all types of uh, conservation and uh, research. So, and then we promised that today we will move from there. So in today's webinar, we will specifically address uh, three main topics. We are going to uh, look at mushroom identification, including giving you a guide to how you can be able to identify mushrooms in the field. Then we will also look at further high naturalist tools in mushrooms and especially mushroom research and conservation. And this, we promise that Carlos is going to take you through a practical session so that we can be able to do this even in the field, practically, although online. And then lastly, we also look at mushroom uh, cultivation for improved livelihood and how you can be able to engage in entrepreneurship uh, using uh, mushrooms. So in this context, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, this webinar will be delivered by presenters, especially from the partner organizations. And then this will be followed by responses to questions and comments from you participants. So in an open discussion. So we are going to, or the presenters will answer your questions after they have made all the three presentations. Therefore, this interactive uh, webinar therefore invites all our participants to be able to like your questions, and your comments in the chat section. So please, during the webinar, as we continue, just put your comments and your questions in the chat section, because we will be going to follow uh, that arrangement to be able to answer them. Uh, then I am, as you can see, we are recording the webinar. So that version, the recorded version, will be available after the end of uh, this webinar, just like we have done uh, recorded version of uh, series one. It's already uh, in our project YouTube, Facebook. Therefore, the same will happen today or after today or when we are available, we will are going to upload the recorded version of the entire presentations. I can request Dr. Mary to put the, in the chat the details or the link to our YouTube and also our Facebook and also our email project so that in case we would want to uh, follow up, we will be able to do that. And also maybe also the emails for our presenters, both for the series, that is uh, webinar series one, and also today's series. That's what like we promised you, that we are going to give you a certificate of participation. So all participants will be issued with a certificate of participation, although this will be next week after we have gathered those of you who participated and then we uh, develop these certificates and then we are going to email them to your emails. So it's something that will be uh, downloadable. Maybe 
a PDF of certificate. So ladies and gentlemen, you can see we have those who have just joined be, uh, after I have started, I said, my name is, I'm Dr. Mushani Mushai. I work for the University of Nairobi, uh, the wildlife section, which is a section of the Department of Clinical Studies, where we train students on wildlife conservation management. So today I will be your moderator. So ladies and gentlemen, for those few remarks also, I think uh, I wish you all a very successful webinar. Thank you very much. So we are going to go straight from here now to the presenters. Like I said, I want to share the table today or the program. Yeah, let me get to the program, don't worry. So that twist. I think this is our program. Okay, let me share the program. This is our program, as you can see. So now we are mushroom identification guide. So that one will be followed by a 25 minute presentation, which will be followed by Dr. Carlos, the iNaturist tool in mushroom, as I said, it's more or less an one hour presentation, which will involve some practicals. We are expected at least to have our phones with the iNaturist application, which you can download directly from Google Store or Play Store. Then uh, we'll have Susan Kafasia uh, with another 25 minutes of presentation, mushroom cultivation, especially for improved life. And then after that, we'll have questions. And then we'll have uh, closing remarks. So I want now this juncture to invite Dr. Mary Nyawela now to give us her presentation. Thank you. Distinguished guests and all participants, once again, my name is uh, Mary Nyawira Mushane, a research scientist at the National Museums of Kenya. I am here to give a talk on mushroom identification kind with the aim of introducing some skills important in mushroom classification. Welcome. Another important skill citizen scientists need to effectively contribute to macrophage research and conservation is to have basic skills in macrophage identification. And the first question we need to ask ourselves is, why macrophage identification? 
Skills in macrophage identification are very key because they enable us to group these macrophage species in different categories depending on their cross relationships. This in return helps us communicate effectively uh, to other scientists or to other citizen scientists about what we have found or about what we have discovered. Another reason why we need the basic skills in mushroom identification is to enable us to participate effectively in mushroom research. When we know the mushroom species in our community or in our area, it is now possible to formulate hypotheses. It's also possible to formulate research questions uh, regarding the groups of species in our community. And in, when we do this, we are able now to carry out an important research about their management or about their sustainable utilization. Another reason why we are supposed to have basic skills in mushroom identification is classification knowledge help, helps us know, and it also helps us appreciate mushroom diversity in our community. This makes mushroom correction and research exciting, especially when you see some species you, you have heard about, or when you see some species that you know about, about them. Another reason why it is important to have basic skills in mushroom identification is that it helps us discover new species in our area. We can only know or we can only ascertain that the species we have documented has never been documented before or it is new into science if we have some basic uh, mushroom identification skills. Lastly, we need these basic identification skills to enable us to discover economically important species in our community or in our areas. Uh, this will help us differentiate between edible and poisonous species. It will also so help us uh, understand the species, the, the uses of the species community in our area. We can understand the, the mushroom species in our area that have medicinal properties that can be used for dye, that can be used to expand the mushroom industry. And when now we have this knowledge in our, with ourselves, we are able now to contribute effectively to mushroom research and its conservation. Having known the importance of basic knowledge in mushroom identification, in the next slides, we are going to discuss the basic methods that are used in mushroom identification and that are used in mushroom classification. Basically, we have two methods used in mushroom identification and classification. The first method is the traditional method. This method utilizes the visible macro, macroscopic traits as well as invisible traits, also known as microscopic traits. The method also utilizes the mushroom habitat or where the mushroom is growing, and it also utilizes the behavior of a mushroom, how the mushroom relates with its environment. Another method that is used in mushroom classification is the molecular method. This method utilizes the genetic traits to identify mushroom or macrophage species. We all know that individual species are known to have a unique genetic background or to have a unique genetic information. This information is usually found in one gene region or it can also be found in a few gene region. This genetic information or what you are calling the background, when it is utilized, it helps us in identification of species or it will help us in identification of macrophage species. In this molecular method, DNA is extracted from corrected mushroom species, or the DNA is extracted from corrected mushroom community. After extraction of the DNA, the DNA fragment carrying genetic information or fragment carrying genetic background 
using mushroom identification are amplified or they are multiplied to produce many copies of the original DNA fragment. These DNA fragments or these backgrounds are thereafter sequenced or they are read to know their chemical basis and at the same time to know their sequence, to know the sequence of these chemical bases. Now to know the mushroom species corrected. So we have the comparison between the genetic information of a known species with the genetic information of known species. And now from this comparison, we are able to know the macrophage species we are dealing with or the macrophage species we have corrected. Molecular methods of mushroom identification are gaining preferences by many scientists. The reason being the molecular mushroom identification method are very quick and also very accurate. The method can also be used to identify fungal community in an area without now correcting individual species. This means if I correct soil sample from a given ecosystem, it is possible to use molecular methods to know the fungal diversity in that area. However, this method, although they are very quick and accurate, they have several disadvantages. One of them, the method is very expensive. And in here in Kenya, one sample can be identified with, at a cost of 5,000 to 10,000 Kenya shillings. Another disadvantage of this method is that only few mushroom species up to now have been sequenced. This makes it hard or difficult to find reference information to compare the sequenced DNA of unknown mushroom species. The second method used in macrophage classification is traditional method. This method traces both the macroscopic and the microscopic traits to identify the macrophage species. In addition, the method traces the habitat information as well as the mushroom behavior. In the next slide, we are going to discuss the macroscopic traits used in macrophage identification. Uh, we can say that the macroscopic traits are the traits that are visible or they are traits that we can see with our naked eyes. These include the features of a cup. The cup is usually the upper part of the mushroom or the macrophage. Uh, the second one is the characteristic of the stipe. And, and we say the stipe connects the cup with the mycelia or it connects the cup with the substrate. And the other one we, we, we use is the nature of spore producing tissues. And we know in the spore producing tissues, we can have the gills, we can have the pores, we can have the ranges. So all these traits, when they, brought, they are brought together, they help us classify and assign names to macrophage species we have corrected. The first trait we describe in a mushroom specimen is a cup or the upper part of the mushroom. In a cup, we reckon the color, the size, the shape, the texture, the moisture, the ondua, and also the consistency. Mushroom cups usually come in different shapes and texture. The most common shapes we'll find in the field when correcting mushroom are the convex shaped mushroom or the curved cups. We also come across conical shaped mushroom, or we also come across the bell shaped mushroom. We also come across the bonnetent mushroom or mushroom with a raised center. We also come across the flat shaped mushroom uh, and also we'll come across mushroom with the depressed cups or cups that are funnel shaped. Other subs we'll find in the field with a crowned fan shaped cup commonly found in polypos. We also find bottle like shapes found in puff balls. We also found funnel shaped fungi we we'll also find bird nest shaped macrophage, avista shaped macrophage, cup shaped macrophage, branched, and also coral like shapes, among others. In the field, we we'll also find cups which come in different textures. We'll find cups, cups which are smooth 
or caps with no ornamentation. We'll also find hairy caps. We'll also find caps with the raised scales. Others have flat scales, and also and others have patches of of ornamentation. The correction of these shapes and texture are very key in mushroom identification. Another trait we use in macrophagic classification is so spore producing tissues. And we usually have ma two main types of tissues, the gills and the pores. The pores come in different color. They come in different shapes and sizes. For example, we have the angular pores. We have the round pores, and also we can have mushroom with the microscopic pores, the pore that we can not see with our naked eyes. We can also have mushroom with the tooth-like pores. In addition, we have we have spores that are produced in a ball-like structure, and this one is usually common with the puffballs. We also have spores that are produced in ridges like structures, as we can see from this slide. Apart from the pores, we, uh, we also have gills as a spore producing tissues. Gills come in different colors, and it's usually very important to document the colors of the gills when you are in the field. In the gills, we are also interested in knowing how they are attached to the site. If you go to the field, we will find gills which, have, which are free, and these are the gills which are not attached to the site. We also come across gills that are straightly attached to the stipe. This form of attachment is usually called and next. Uh, we also find gills that are running down the stipe. And uh, this form of attachment we, is usually called the current. We are also interested in knowing how the gills are arranged. And they come in different, uh, in three different ways. We can have grounded gills. We can have cross gills, and we can also have distance gills. Another trait we look in gills is the presence of the veins. Here we show a, a, a mushroom which have an, a gills that are attached to the stem, and we can also see the veins that are running across the, the gills. Gills color attachment and arrangement are very important traits in separating among similar species. Here we see similar species, but they have different gills color. The first specimen is a conocible species with the brown gills, while the other is a mycena species with a, with a white gills. In this other photo, we have the macrorepiota species with the white gills, and in the other one, we have chloroforum species with green gills. The macrolepiota species is edible, while the chloroforum species is poisonous. This shows the importance of using gills to identify mushroom or to recognize mushroom in the field. Gills color may change with the age. So when you are in the field, it's important to note whether the color you are reading from a mushroom, it is from a young species or a mature species. For example, in this, this slide, we see Leratiomis gills changing from white gills in a young species. And this, uh, the gills darkens and becomes dark brown as the species mature. It is thus very important to record gills color from both the young and mature species. Another macrophagic structure we describe to help us in mushroom identification is the stipe. The stipe connects the cup and the mycelia, or it connects the cup with the sample strate where the mushroom is growing. The traits that we look for when describing the, the stipe in the field include the color and the texture. So we, when you are in the field, we, look, uh, we check whether the stipe is brittle or firm. We check whether the stipe is smooth or hollow. We check whether the stipe is chalky or dusty. And we also check whether the stipe is curry or leathery. Another trait that we look at the stipe are the presence and absence of universal veil or the partial veil. 
Universal fill is usually a veil that covers the entire mushroom as it is sprout or as it grows. The veil usually ruptures as the mushroom grows. We will know that the mushroom was covered by a universal veil when we find its remnant on either the cup or the stipe. In the cup, the universal veil remnant is usually evidenced by its remnant called the what? In this type, we have the socks like structure called the vulva, and this and these two structure when we see them in the field in a mushroom, it is evidence that the mushroom was covered with a universal veil. Uh, the partial veil, on the other hand, covers only the mushroom gills. The presence of the partial veil in a mushroom or a macrophage is usually evidenced by the presence of annulus ring. The annulus ring come in different shapes. We have the pendant, the fraying, the sheathing, the double, the cobweb, and the ring zone. Uh, in this slide, we show photos of the some common shapes of the annulus ring. Another trait we use in mushroom identification is the type shape, presence of the cuticle, and also the presence of mycelia like roots. The cuticle is usually the skin of the mushroom, and we can know whether the mushroom has a skin when we peel off. Mushroom types come in various shapes. We have the, the mushroom with a, an equal type. We have a mushroom that has a crab shape. We have a mushroom that, that has a bump, uh, that is barbarous. We have a mushroom with a vulva. We may also have a mushroom that is deep rooted. We also have the mushroom that have mycelia. All these are the common traits we need to describe when here in the field to help us in identification of the mushrooms. Another trait that we need to check in the field is the presence of breeding or oozing of any liquid in a mushroom or when the mushroom is bruised. This trait is especially very important in identification of Ractaria species and some of the Agarica species. Another trait to use in macrophage identification is the color of spores or the color of spore print. Different macrophage species produces spores of different color. In this line, we can see how colors varies among spore prints from different species. The spore print is usually very vital in separating different families. Apart from using the visible trait or the macroscopic trait, it is also very vital to use microscopic traits or the traits that we cannot see with our naked eyes in mushroom identification. One of the microscopic traits we use in mushroom identification is usually the size and the shape of the spores. Uh, at the same time, we usually like to check on the reaction of these spores with certain reagents or certain stains like Mesa reagent. In this photo, we show different shapes, different ornamentation and colors of some mushroom species. Another microscopic trait we use to identify macrophage is observation of spore producing organs. In the Basidiomycota species, there are some species that produces infertile basidium. This infertile basidium is usually called the stidia. So the presence and absence of the stindia in any species is a very key structure that is used to, to separate species in the same genus. The third microscopic trait that we use in separating among species is the hyphae connection. There are some species in Bicidiomycota phyram that form hyphae with the cramp connection. The observation of cramp connection, therefore, becomes a key trait in separating species from the same genus. Another trait used in, used in discriminating against species is the habitat where the mushroom or the macrophage is growing. 
We also use the behavior of this mushroom in relation to the environmental factors and also in relation with other species. Macrophagy species usually grow in different habitats. We have macrophagy species that are decomposers growing in dent tree stumps. Other, other grow in dent rita like reeds and twigs. Other grow grow in animal dung. Other decomposes the soil organic matter. Other species of the macrophagy are usually parasitic. They depend on the living organism for food. Others, they form symbiotic relationship with the plant species, where both the fungi and the plant benefit. Other traits that we are interested in when we are looking at the macrophagy is, the, is how these macrophagy are relating with the external environment. We need to understand the growth of these macrophagy in relation to the rainfall, in the relation to the amount of humidity, in relation to the temperature, and also the altitude. These traits are also very important in discriminating among species. Traditional method of macrophagy identification using morphological traits is the most common method used in macrophagy classification and identification. The method is prevalent because it is easy to apply. The method can also be applied by a wide range of people. The method is also not very expensive. However, this method has several disadvantages. One of them is that the morphological traits can be very confusing, and this can result in wrong naming. The method is also uh, very tedious, therefore it is time consuming. Classi classification within kingdom fungi is not yet stable. There are several revision undergoing. The current classification that was made in the year 2018, it divided the fungi of a 16 division or phyla. The macrophagy were classified into phyram, the phyram ascomycota, and the phyram basidiomycota. The species from this phyram were separated mainly by the mode of spore production. Spore production from the species from ascomycota phyram. They are usually produced in a necrosed structure called ascus. The phyram ascomycota has about 64 species. These species are classified, are classified in 15 classes, 68 orders, 327 family, and over 6,000 genera. In this slide, we show some of the species that you may find in the field from this phyram. On the other hand, species in Basidiomycota phyram produces spores on a crab like structure called Basidium. The phyram Basidiomycota has over 30,000 species. These species are classified in three subphyram. In this subphyram, we have 16 classes, 52 orders, 177 families, and over 1500 genera. Species from this phyram range from good mushroom, jelly like mushroom, polypose, half bar, bird nest, coral like fungi, as star, crust like fungi, as well as stick and horn species. From this talk, I have given some overview of the basic skills we may need to help us in macrophagy identification. We have also shown the importance of having these identification skills. We are currently working in producing a simple mushroom field guide to mushrooms of Kenya. This field guide will continue all the information we have learned from, the, from these two webinars. Those interested in receiving this 
again when it's out please share with us your email addresses and we'll contact you as soon as the guide is out as i conclude i wish to thank the i naturalist team uh, for supporting this webinar and for supporting this work I also wish to thank the National Museums of Kenya, Nairobi University, and all Kenivo staff for supporting this work. I also thank all of us for joining and listening. To all of us, thank you. Let's continue keeping the mushroom research ongoing. So thank you very much, Dr. Mary. That was very exciting. So. Uh, as I have said before, we are kind of requesting that part uh, the participants, if you can be able to write down your questions and your comments in the chat section. So just write the questions there and also your comments for that particular present, pre presenter so that immediately after we look and hear the other presenters, then we can go to the discussion section and then you can be able to answer those questions there. So thank you very much. So I'm going, we are going now to move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter now is uh, Dr. Carlos, who is going now to give us uh, the iNaturalist tools now in a practical way. So Dr. Carlos, welcome. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much to all of the participants. Uh, good morning from here. Remember, I live, in, I live in Northeast Mexico, so it's early morning around here. But that, that's, uh, I'm really happy that I can be here with you today and the second seminar series. And yes, we're going to talk a little bit more on how iNaturalist works and how we can use it to identify and to get a better approach and what kind of biodiversity are or is around us. So uh, I'm gonna jump quickly so we can have uh, my screen share. Let's see if this can work. So yes, okay. So we should be seeing now my, my screen and I'm gonna try. And we're gonna we're gonna start uh, before we jump into uh, the actual how to use it. Uh, we're gonna see some basics on on how to to create an account, how to start using a naturalist from zero. I I know that some of you might already have this kind of knowledge, but for new users, I want to make sure that everybody can start using iNaturalist from their homes, from the local areas that you are interested in working. So iNaturalist is, remember, just a tool to help you identify a species. Is not see here to replace traditional methods of identification. I mean, it's not here to replace uh, museums or collection specimens that provide really valuable information for scientists across the globe. This is just taking advantage of the digital and technological era, which really brings the world together. So again, iNaturalist is not here to replace traditional research methods. This is just a complement of information that allows uh, citizens across the planet to actually participate in research. So iNaturalist has a, a complete web uh, platform. You can use iNaturalist from, and from uh, uh, the web-based platform, which is www.inaturalist.org. I'm sorry, I'm missing here. Okay, iNaturalist.org. Wait, what? <laughs> Something is happening. Well, okay. iNaturalist.org is the web 
platform for the whole planet. But uh, as I mentioned on the first series, there are a series of countries that we have our localized and national platform. And I hope sometimes your country will have theirs too. Right now we are seeing here Naturalista, but strangely, Here we go. Okay. iNaturalist, this is how the iNaturalist platform will see for any other country that doesn't have uh, that doesn't have uh, their their national network. So if you are new to iNaturalist, you will just go to iNaturalist.org or you can download the cell phone app. Remember the cell phone works both for Android or iOS. So Again, you don't need to have an expensive cell phone or the latest technology. You just need to have the intention to actually participate on iNaturalist. If you are already here on iNaturalist.org, you will just have to go to login or sign up. If you are a new user, they will ask you the email or your existing uh, username. You can see here that uh, my username uh, is already here because, well, I am I really do work a lot with uh, iNaturally, so I have it already uh, saved on my computer. But any kind of email will work, whether if that's the, the common ones like Gmail, uh, Microsoft Outlook, or whatever institutional uh, e email you are using, that is what you're going to use for uh signing in into iNaturalist when you're signing in i need you to take aware that this is a global community that shares information not just with scientists but all the information has the chance to go to other biodiversity repositories so there's a couple of things that you will need to agree before you start participating into iNaturalist and yes this is one of the most important. Yes, license my photos, sounds, and observations to scientists so they can use data. This is really, really important because we'll allow other people across the planet to use your information uh, for a different, in a different, a uh, lot of different ways. And yes, I can say to iNaturalist to store and process limited kinds of personal information. And you can agree also with the terms of, of uh, service and privacy. I've been using iNaturalist since 2013. And so far, this is one of the safest uh, websites to actually share information, personal information. And most importantly, there are millions of people sharing biodiversity information. So I really encourage you, all of you, especially new users, to actually allow iNaturalist to have access to your information uh, because, well, there's a lot of uh, a big community in there that can really benefit for all these information. I'm just going back and this is where I show you to sign up, but I'm just logging in. If I'm logging in, sometimes you can use your Facebook or your Google uh, account also to log in into iNaturalist. This is another good advantage if you are new to uh, iNaturalist. So again, my username is already here and I'm just going to log in. Remember, if you're using the web-based platform or you're using the cell phone app, it's the same. They're not separate accounts. Whatever you upload an observations from your cell phone, it will automatically reflect on the web-based platform. So they will synchronize each time you use any of them. But remember to use the same email uh, on any of those. Well, these are the basics uh, of, of the iNaturalist and how to log in. There are a lot of different features to actually share and work and show, but we have limited time today. So we are going just to focus on the most basic ones. Uh, I wanna go back here and so, 
Uh, this is your dashboard. You can see your profile here. Another thing that I really encourage is to actually edit your profile, share your name, share what you do. Here is in Spanish, but here it says that I am a biologist and I like uh, uh, photography. I'm not a professional photography and photographer, I'm sorry. But well, you can see my, my silly profile picture. This is an, an alien uh, made of vegetables. So it's, it really works like a social network and, and it really helps people that you share a little bit of who you are. It doesn't matter if you are a, a world authority on some specific taxa or if you are just a nature uh, uh, enthusiast that want to share biodiversity observations, please share who you are because this really helps uh, to build community among people in your area and especially well this is a, a world uh, where a worldwide community so share who you are okay and if you're sharing i'm going back here because okay the, in the dashboard you have your profile you have your observations you have a calendar where you can track how many or how much observations you have done. This is really important because uh, this is kind of a journal on how much observations you have. And you can see here that uh, we have like dark dots on each day when you have uploaded a lot of observations on some of observations. So this is another good uh, things to actually look for. But okay, so I'm going to jump to the explore page. This, this is explore page is one of the most important pages because it will show observations in any area or of any kind of organism, no matter where you are in the world. This is the place to explore biodiversity. And you can see here that uh, in my screen says, Nuevo León, which is the, the state in where I live with here in Mexico. And it automatically shows all the uh, biodiversity species observations that we have around my, my state. And we can change this. There are a lot of two main uh, filters. One of here is species. But it's not restricted to species. You can type any kind of taxa like animals and automatically will show animals from my state. We can change to my country. This is the basic use of the explore. So we can have a, a good idea on how much we can explore on this basic uh, page. So we can change to any level of, of geographical area. Even we can, if we go to filters here, we have more filters and we can even uh, type more specific places beyond countries or districts or states or departments from, depending on the country, we have different kind of a range on geographical area. Uh, but then we can go just to, Your country and what we'll show we'll, we'll see the, all the animals in Kenya here we can just leave it uh, blank in the space uh, that says species and we will see uh, the whole biodiversity that, had, that has been already documented to to your country we can also go to filters here we can see plants if we cl I click on this little uh, green leaf icon here, we will see how much, uh, how many plants will are already documented here. This is a way in, in how we can start exploring a little bit on biodiversity. And we will see that you have more than 6,000 species already documented, nearly 8,000 observations already uploaded. And we can see that uh, most observations are focused on uh, vertebrate species. So this leaves a lot of room for other groups like plants and arthropods to actually uh, take uh, advantage on observations later on. And we have a couple of examples here that we're gonna work a little bit later on. on so we can, we can 
practice on, on how we can work on identification and uploading. Uh, okay, I'm gonna jump back to, we, we saw this on how create an account. There are a lot of uh, basic things also, when you are downloading the, the mobile app into your cell phone, uh, please take again, uh, notice that you should grant permission for the app to actually access your camera and your location. And this is one of the most important things for new users. If you are taking uh, photographs with your cell phone, please make sure you have your GPS enabled when you are taking pictures. And this comes in a lot of ways in different cell phone models that you can you just go to camera settings and then just allow your camera to use uh, geo privacy, geo tags, locations. It, it comes in a, in a different uh, way, in different names, in different models of cell phones. But remember, allow your camera to access the GPS on your cell phone because this way, each time you take a photograph, it will have also uh, the, the geographical coordinates for that specific picture. And this will really be helpful if, when you are taking uh, observations and when you are uploading. We've been talking a little bit about observations here. So what is an observation? An observation is an encounter of a person with nature. With biodiversity, this can be, uh, with this can this can take a lot of uh, shapes, and remember that if you're maybe participating in a group activity, different persons can have the same encounter with the same organism. So sometimes, and it's allowed to different people to take pictures of the same organism and then upload those observations into a naturalist. That there is no problem. But there's not just this idea of taking photograph of living organisms. You can take photos of animals killed in the road, maybe just tracks, like maybe feathers. Uh, you can also record sounds and upload them. The one thing that is not allowed on iNaturalist is video. You cannot upload video. You can upload sounds and you can upload images or photographs. <clears throat> but, well, maybe sometime in the future, we will be able to actually upload videos. will will take a lot of uh, space on, on the iNet servers. <clears throat> but then, again, it's not just remember to take photographs of living organisms remember you can also take uh dead organisms to to actually upload it on on i naturalist and we're going to see how that works a little bit later if we are here in the i naturalist page there's this green uh button that says upload that's this is just the basic um, way to upload uh photographs and again i'm gonna oops I'm gonna make a little exercise here and how to quickly upload. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if you are seeing, well, I'm, I'm trying to drag my uh, a few observations here and I hope you are seeing my whole screen. So let me know if you are not seeing anything, but I'm gonna start dragging and drop this is using the the web page platform is really uh, the fastest way to upload uh, a lot of observations at the same time like here i'm going to just start dropping uh, a bunch of pictures in here and then <clears throat> and then we're going to work with them uh, real quick to see how how this can work for us in a better way all these photos that i took they are from around my home and uh, okay this is it we might think that 
Okay. So you can see here that <clears throat> it says here, submit 11 observations. We have like a bunch of photographs that they are not arranged. They have not, uh, uh, like they, they don't have any information so far. You can see that I have this uh, roll runner that we have here. I have two pictures of them. Remember, if you can take different pictures from the same organism, but then just, just have to put them all together in the same observation. So this one here, this is just one observation with two photographs of the same organism. This is really important. Like we have this butterfly here, and we have this one here. This is the same organism. So we need to put them together in the same observations. Remember, now we have nine observations, not 11. You see that this is a blurry picture. That's OK. Remember that we don't have to be like professional photographers. And again, I'm just merging photographs from the same organism all together. Please don't put photographs of different organisms in the same observation like this this is not correct you can see that i have one bird here i have this one here and this uh, this butterfly in the same observations they don't belong together they need to be on separate observations you just drag and drop and organize them uh, in the same in the same observations so we can see here that now we have not 11, but six observations already arranged. And you can see here that they have no name on the species. They have date and they have, uh, but they don't have a location because I didn't turn the GPS or my camera didn't have a GPS uh, working at the time I took the photograph. But you don't have to worry. You can edit, you can change location, or you can add locations. This is really easy. You just need to click on the location bar here on any of the photographs. And you can see the whole world here, but I'm going to zoom in into my home. This is where I live. <clears throat> And we took this together near uh, a river around here. We were, where were we? This is my city. You can see here. And okay, here we go. This is a, a nearby canyon that we took these photographs around here. So let me know that. Okay, somewhere around here. Yes. Okay, so I just make a click when I am pretty sure I saw this bird here. So I just make a click and you can see that coordinates are moving if we just click in different areas, but I'm gonna just put this here and I set upload observations. And I'm gonna do the same with the other ones. This would be a reflection here. The other one was going farther in here. And this other bird was somewhere around here. You can see that you can edit uh, all these observations very quickly here. This was actually taken a lot farther in here. And this butterfly taking probably around here so you can see now that okay they all have date they all have the proper location these are the two most important features for our observations date and time and location and of course well this is the evidence of what you see the evidence is quite important because it will allow uh, regular observations to later become an uh, research grade observations. A naturalist, remember, is not meant for biologists, is not meant for people who already know biodiversity. A naturalist is meant for people who doesn't know probably what they are seeing. If you don't know the name of any organism that you are uploading, 
that's perfectly okay because there are a lot of people out there that will help you to identify your observations. You can see that the species name is just blank. We can send the observations like this and it will be okay. People will see, let me show you. Oh, now I'm seeing, uh, now I'm seeing my, my Mexican, the Mexican, uh, if you see, if you see it here, this is my Mexican site. But if you don't know what you are seeing, you can see that this fly is says unknown. This little spider says unknown. This flower says unknown. So this is people who doesn't know the name of the organisms that they are seeing. I mean, here is a, a polypore mushroom that says unknown. This is a really interesting fungus that says unknown. So people submit observations without knowing what they are seeing. So don't worry if you don't. iNaturalist now has a, a really great features of suggestions. Remember, these are just suggestions of what you might be seeing. If you click in the species name, it will says loading suggestions and it will give you a list of organisms that look I like the photograph that you are seeing. And they will say, this is pretty sure that we are in the genus uh, Pitangus. I know this bird and I know that this is the species Pitangus sulfuratus. Uh, but then these are just suggestions. If in your area there are uh, a little number or a low number of observations, this, wasn't, this won't work very well and you will have organisms probably from other parts of the world. So I advise you to be cautious using this. This is a really common bird around my area. So it will give me a good suggestions on genus and species. This butterfly will do the same. This is the genus Asterocampa. And this uh, dragonfly probably it will give me another good one. Yes, so I'm gonna this dip onto genus level, and again this is a very common bird here. This is the alba, and the butterfly here is really common too. I'm gonna just leave it to species level. So all these are just information, uh, suggestions on identifications. Again, if we are dealing probably with our organisms like mushrooms, uh, Dr. Marie already told us of uh, different, very important features to take uh, notice when we are photographing. So remember, if you have photographed from different angles of a mushroom, you can upload all those photographs from the same organism into one observation. You can upload uh, a photograph of the whole mushrooms. You can uh, take a pictures of beneath the mushroom and show the gills. You can take a photograph of the mushroom into the substrate, whether if in the soil, if in dead wood, even a living uh, tree. Remember to include all those photographs into the observations. And then you can add notes like it has smell, it has a secretion. You can add additional information into this area so people can have more information for proper identification. Uh, this kind of, of information, of course, uh, it changes from organism to organism. Oops. Just put this away. So remember, just don't mix observations from different organisms in the same observations. Make different organisms different. Uh, and I'm going to submit now. It's just saving. <clears throat> And it, it works really, really easy. And I'm going to now uh, try to project uh, my cell phone into the computer so I can show you also how it works on, on the cell phone. 
please let me know if you are seeing I hope this works. I hope, I really hope this works. This is, uh, one, two. Looks like maybe I'm maybe having trouble with this. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me. No, it doesn't doesn't want. I'm I'm sorry about this. I'm, this was working a few minutes ago, but right now uh, doesn't like. Uh, I hate when technical problems arise, but um, let me let me make one more try because I really wanted to to show you. Okay, I'm gonna try again. So I can project my cell phone here. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's taking too long. Doesn't look like it's gonna work. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm really sorry about this. It should be working, but it's it's not working for me right now. <clears throat> well, sorry about that. Let me see very quickly. Okay, then I'm, I had a backup plan, but then I'm, I will be using this this slide, so we can we can see a little bit how it works on on our cell phone. Whether if you have already downloaded the the cell phone app, it will also it will you will have to log in using your existing or your previous email that you maybe already use on the on the web platform, and this is how you will see. <clears throat> Let me see if I can okay here okay. You will see your observations, your number, the number of species, how many identifications you have made, and all the observations will be shown in here. We will have this little green button in, in the bottom of the screen of the cell phone, and you just have to click here, and then you will have this kind of options. You can add observations with no photograph, which is not, wait, what, no, I don't want to project. <laughs> Uh, you can take photographs from you directly using in the app, but I don't recommend using the app to take photos because it will, oh, come on. Now I'm having technical problems, but... Close it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Again, sorry about that. <clears throat> Looks like I'm, I'm sabotaging myself here. But then 
I don't recommend to take pictures directly from the app because it will take a lot of time. The, I will recommend you to choose images that you already took in the field. This, this is really more easier for all of us. But yes, there's another feature that it will allow you to record sounds directly from the cell phone app. This is really, this is really a good feature for all of us. But then you can go there and choose images. <clears throat> you will go to your files, your gallery, and you can just go to your, your photographs. Uh, so you can just choose your photographs and then you can see this is my my gallery here and you can see that i have different pictures from the same organism in this case these are just little moths and flies little insects around there so <clears throat> you can see here that i selected three different pictures from the same fly here you can add as many as 20 photographs from the same organism and you can add them during the original upload or you can add them later <clears throat> even after uh, a few months or even years if you have this the pictures from the same organisms you can see here that location is here you can add them or modify it according uh, to your needs but again if you have your gps turn it on it will automatically show the both the date, the time, and the locations. Remember, this is very, very important for observations to have the evidence, to have location, and to have the time and the date. Again, you can you can leave the species just in blank, but you will have also the choice to have suggestions. Uh, one really uh, cool feature of the cell phone app is that if you click on any of these photographs, you can edit the photograph. You can crop, you can change uh, contrast, you can change the illumination, you can change colors, you can edit a lot of features from each of these photographs by just clicking in this little pencil here. But then again, I'm going back to what you see. If you click on the, what did you see, you will be giving uh, suggestions of what you might be seeing. And especially for some organisms, they're really, really difficult to identify directly for one single photograph. But in this case, the, the cell phone app is giving us a really good uh, identifications all the way to super family. This is Tephroidea. Uh, this is a really hard to identify group of insects, but again, this is a starting point for all of us who want to know about what we are seeing now. <clears throat> uh, again, you can just type here what you see. This is a, a diptera, uh, all the flies here, and you can just choose a large group if you are not confident on what you see. And then you just go and use this little uh, check mark to upload observations. If you are using cell phone, I really suggest or strongly suggest that you go to your settings and remove the, the check mark from the automatic upload because if you don't do this, whenever you put an observation into a naturalist, it will automatically upload any observation and it will really uh, consume uh, data from your internet plan. So make sure you have this uh, on check so you can upload observations when you are connected to a, a Wi-Fi network that doesn't consume internet data from your cell phone. Again, then you will just have to upload your observations in here. And finally, this is how an observation look in the cell phone. You will see uh, the main pictures and you can see here that we have like six different photographs. You can scroll from them and we have the name. We have uh, uh, my, my original suggestion here. Uh, I have provided uh, an external uh, link to provide what 
So I might be thinking this is the correct identification. And then we have uh, another people uh, agreeing with what I, I'm seeing here. Uh, again, this is this is kind of a, a, well, not too detailed uh, how to upload observations into iNaturalist, but it's not really that different from what we do with other social networks when we are uploading uh, uh, observations here. Uh, I'm going back to, uh, you can see here that the, the ones that we have uploaded, they're already here. But then after we have, uh, uploaded all these observations, sometimes we will need to identify, and this is really, really important because there's a, a specific page to identify observations or organisms on iNaturalist. You can see the explore page. This is where we were working. You can see your observations here you can see uh, a lot of community uh, things around here. This is uh, an actual uh, web page when you can see where people are, are working. But there's a specific page for making identifications when uh, observations that need to be identified will be, will be shown. And it works uh, pretty much like the Explore page. Uh, you can uh, narrow this down by species or groups, and you can narrow this by uh, by a geographical region. Let's say that we want to work with uh, mushrooms. Here's the Philum basidiomycota, and we will show all the ones that need identification in my state. You can see that there are a lot of them that need to be identified, but then we're going to go to your country. And now I am seeing a lot of uh, mushrooms from Kenya that need identifications. Some of them, they already have species level, like this one. You can see here that uh, if you click in any of these ones, it will give you uh, this little window here that will show the photographs. This one has like a, a good uh, reference for size here. It also have, if you click them, uh, you will see a, a, a zoom in on the identification. You can see details on the heels. You can see details uh, on, the, on the cap. And this one has already uh, an, uh, a species level identification. I don't know if this is correct. So because I am not an expert, I cannot confirm that this is the proper species. So I will encourage all of the researchers that know about species that actually visit this page. And I'm gonna cut this and put it into the chat. So researchers on your on your country will have access to this uh, particular uh, web direction with address, so they can actually take a look and then confirm or deny this kind of uh, identifications. Sometimes uh, we can have a more broad identifications like. Uh, just to order level. And if we click here, we can see that, okay, this is uh, shelf mushrooms and it's already located in polyporales. So this kind of uh, identification can just be narrowed down by people who actually know about them, like the researchers in your group, but maybe not for me. What I can do if I am from the other side of the world is look for unknown organisms. You can see that we have filters here and I just click on this little icon with the question mark in it. And then I can click and I can see that there are some insects here 
and I know the family of these ones, so I can add them. So other people from other parts of the world can actually take a look on this. And I'm seeing that this is, you can see that I'm just typing broad uh, identifications to order to uh, really high levels on, on, because I'm not an expert on any of this. And we can see here that we have this, uh, like you probably are more aware of what kind of organisms I am, I am scrolling through. But this is the kind of, of activity that you might expect from people from other parts of the world. So you can start uh, I, starting work with identifications. The thing is that if you already have uh, some mushroom species already on iNaturalist, it will be very, very important for experts to go to those species and actually review them and try to make identifying uh, of those. So it's, it's not that, that difficult. It's not really, I know this one. This one is original from my country. Here. Hmm, nice, you have this. Like this one, here is. Again, this is this is really, really important in case that you are working with specific groups, you can select like birds and amphibians, reptiles, mammals, fishes, uh, uh, mollusk, uh, spiders or arachnids, insects and fungi. You have a specific uh, icon for fungi and you will see that there's a lot of fungi that need to be reviewed by uh, experts, especially the ones that are, have already a species name on it. So you probably can help each other uh, because you know your species. This is where local researchers came in a very important role for iNaturalist to actually work with the species that have already been identified. I'm going to take uh, uh, another jump back to the explore page. I'm going to go to explore page and I'm going to go again to your country and I'm going to, oh, this is an unknown species. Let me, let me open this one. Oh, it doesn't exist. Why? Maybe it's deleted well. Uh, I'm going to go again to fungi <clears throat> and I'm going to show that, okay, you have here, you can see that this observation here says research grade and has this little green banner. A research grade observation is an observation that have uh, certain features that uh, making uh, making different from, from the other observations. What is a research grade observations? Research grade says that these observations have media or evidence, location and date and community consensus of a precise identification. It says here that the original identification was a family level, but then uh, another user came here and identified uh, this species, the, the coral stinkhorn, and then a second user came and agreed with this identification. So this is community identification, and this is how identification works. There's a collaborative effort for users to identify uh, observations on iNaturalist. And of course, some of them are really, really easy to identify because uh, they are very familiar, very unique. They, they don't have like, uh, they don't need microscopic uh, features to be identified. So right now they have two thirds 
of the users agreeing with this. So this is how a research grade observations works. Again, if you have uh, trying to find out, okay, this one, sterium irsutum. I shouldn't be doing this, but this says that needs ID. If I were an expert and I agree with this identification, then you see that it changed to register grade. This is why it's really important that some uh, researchers start reviewing the mushrooms that are already on iNaturalist for your country. <clears throat> Again, I'm, I'm gonna withdraw my identification because I'm not an expert and I cannot confirm that this is, you see that this, uh, the again it's it needs identification because i just withdraw my 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 identification that i just made i just wanted to show how this is really important for you to actually go through this uh observations that need to be reviewed on your because some of them they already have like collections and, and they have like informations from collections like this, this is a really nice photograph and that shows the, the species. So uh, somebody will need to come here and, and actually agree with this. So this is a little uh, work uh, to be done for, for your, your country. You can see that there are a lot of things here that needs to be identified. <clears throat> okay, and finally, iNaturalist also provides information. If we can, uh, there's, okay, there are a lot of uh, other uh, uh, pages that like this taxa info. Taxa info will show information of any kind of organisms, maybe fungi. And it will take me to a specific page for fungi here i have uh, my spanish name ongos but then you will you will have a series of photographs and who's doing uh, the more the, the top number of, of observations who is doing uh, the number of the, the identifications and you can see here that says mexico but you can change this for kenya and you can see that, uh, okay, Salama is the top observer with more than 600 observations. And then we have BRNHM. I don't know who this user is. Remember that a uh, few minutes ago, I told you to share who you are. So, okay, these users have a lot of observations, have a lot of species, have a lot of, of identifications here and, and the profile, but there is no name, there is no photographs. And we can see that uh, this person joined it on 2019. And actually it's been very active. The last uh, activity was just yesterday, but so far, again, we have, no way of knowing what this person is. We can narrow again uh, down from uh, just fungi to maybe to radicales. And again, uh, we have the same users as top observers, top identifiers. You can tag people here just by typing at BRNH on the comment section. And you will see a map. And this is how we can see that we have narrowed this uh, down to, to a country and we can see where all this, but again, if we zoom out, we can see the whole number of uh, observations that have already been uploaded into a naturalist. And we have different we have different information tabs here. We have the about. And, and the about, sometimes we can go to other sites where we'll provide more information. If you are building 
uh, uh, web pages or informations that are on the on, already on the web, you can add information here, or you can ask people like curators and iNaturalist to add links to here. I, I cannot in. Here we go. Okay, I can add new uh, links of information here, especially if you are building local guides, you can add them here. Sometimes we there's a lot of information. Okay, I'm seeing all this in Spanish because I'm located in the other side of the world. So <clears throat> you can see uh, a little bit more about what it's been seeing around uh, Kenya, you can see here that the, this uh, have a lot of observations, and I know that I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to show that you can contribute and you can look for information here on iNaturalist. You can do this from the web page, and you can do this, this from the cell phone app. So uh, I think I'm going to stop here and see if we have uh, questions. On uh, I don't want to jump into other people's time, so. Thank you so much for uh, staying here. I know that there are more than 35 people gathered together. So this is a really important deal. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen. And thank you so much. Good, good, good. Thank you, uh, Carlos, for that nice presentation. So once again, presenters, I mean, uh, our participants, I'm kind of requesting that you can uh, write down the questions and the comments for Carlos for that presentation in the chat section so that we can be able immediately after now our next presenter to be able to come and uh, answer them. So thank you very much. So I hope uh, we can move on uh, to now our next presentation. This presentation will come now from Tushan Kafasia. She's from the National Museums of Kenya, She's a research scientist and also a specialist in uh, mushroom farming and cultivation. So uh, we are going to hear from Susan. So Susan, uh, welcome. Uh -huh. Let me see from Susan. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Kabashia. I am a research scientist from the National Museums of Kenya, and I take this opportunity first and foremost, uh, and this is uh, to appreciate the fact that I've been given this opportunity uh, to present uh, to you today. I'll be presenting on mushroom cultivation, and this is for improved uh, livelihoods uh, in Kenya. And uh, uh, mushrooms are, are of great economic value, and this is as food. Uh, both uh, wild edible and uh, medicinal mushrooms are vital, and this is because they provide a uh, key source for uh, vitamins, for minerals, and also for protein. And also, uh, they are very important uh, income uh, generation uh, activities. And uh, over uh, 2,000 uh, wild edible mushrooms have been do documented in the wild, and we have uh, 650 uh, mushrooms that are of uh, medicinal uh, value. Uh, in East Africa, we have uh, 351 species uh, that are known for edibility, whereas in Kenya, we have over 100 species, and uh, these ones are in uh, uh, different groups. Uh, they, are been, uh, they have been recognized as the termitophilic and the ectomycorrhiza and the saprophytic uh, mushrooms. And uh, we find that uh, the ectomycorrhiza and uh, the termitophilic uh, mushrooms are the most preferred. And this is uh, probably uh, because of their flavor and uh, the good uh, taste. Uh, however, we also have the saprophytic uh, mushrooms that are equivalent to those ones that have been cultivated, and they mostly uh, grow on wood. Uh, some of them are 
are oysters. Uh, these are wild oysters and the wood ear mushrooms and also the ganodama, which are actually uh, prepared uh, into tea extracts. And uh, traditionally, uh, mushrooms have been collected from the world, and this is uh, for a long time uh, through gathering and the uh, world collections. And uh, we find that uh, since the 19th century, uh, the discovery of mushrooms uh, came into place. And this is when the uh, uh, mushroom my, my mycelium was discovered as a seed for mushrooms. And since then, uh, cultivation of mushrooms has expanded. And uh, this has been very key because uh, it is one way of protecting the wild uh, edible mushrooms uh, from extinction, uh, mainly because the uh, uh, suitable habitats are disappearing. Uh, uh, through the uh, conversion of the of the of the forested ecosystems, and uh, because of the land use changes, and also the demand for uh, mushroom as an alternative uh, source of, of protein is also increasing in the country. Uh, mushroom as an agribusiness uh, uh, opportunity in Kenya, uh, it is still at its uh, infancy though it is a way of uh, generating income and uh, actually uh, raising the, the livelihoods of the communities. And we find that uh, four species uh, have mainly been uh, brought into cultivation, although only two, two species, uh, mainly button and uh, uh, oyster species, are cal cal cultivated at a, at a larger scale. And uh, when it comes to these other medicinal mushrooms, such as the uh, shiitake and the uh, ganodama, they are cultivated by uh, uh, quite a few, uh, few number of people, and uh, they are also not uh, popular. And uh, in this case, um, we find that uh, 35 uh, uh, mushroom species have uh, been commercially uh, cultivated, and that is worldwide. Uh, however, in Kenya, uh, we have not, not yet uh, brought a, most of the species to domestication. However, that is not to say that uh, research has not been carried out on the species that we have uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the environment. And uh, we found uh, out uh, that uh, uh, a few researchers have uh, done experimental cultivation and especially of the wood ear mushrooms and of the yellow oyster and even of the macrolepiota. And uh, these species have been uh, actually been uh, cultivated up to spawning and even up to utilization and uh, also experimenting with the different uh, types of uh, substrate. And it has been proved possible that we can domesticate some of the species that we have in the wild. And uh, domestication is not uh, difficult, and it is possible for us to domesticate what is in the in our in our habitats, as it has been done in other countries like China, where over 35 species have uh, been brought into 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 commercial cultivation, and so a few stages are normally taken uh, in domesticating the wild edible mushrooms. And the, the first step actually involves the collecting of the uh, mushrooms in the wild. After collecting them, uh, they are taken to the laboratory and they're uh, using aseptic techniques. The mushrooms are cultured on artificial culture media. Then the next step is to prepare the spawn or rather the mushroom seed. And this is using uh, grains that we actually cultivate in the country. Uh, and the fourth step is now um, uh, trying um, to cultivate the mushrooms using the agricultural and the, uh, the, the industrial waste that we generate. And the, why should we cult cultivate mushrooms? The reason as to why we should cultivate mushrooms, uh, one of the reasons is that uh, mushrooms are a, a, a profitable venture and uh, no land is required. And this one makes it uh, possible for all people, or rather 
for the urban dwellers and the rural communities to cultivate mushrooms regardless of them having land. And the other thing is that uh, it is also possible uh, for, for the activity to be carried out by people from uh, different age groups and also from different uh, gender categories. It is an alternative source of protein and for people who don't consume meat who are vegetarians, then this becomes a very good source of protein. The cultivation is also possible and sustainable and because it utilizes the readily available agricultural waste that we generate uh, from uh, maize, 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 maize crops, from uh, cultivating wheat, from cultivating sugar cane, uh, from uh, horticulture, banana leaves. Uh, we have the, the uh, 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 waste from different uh, tree species that can be used to grow actually mushrooms. And the other thing is that mushrooms are, 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 are an important uh, uh, protein source. And you find that uh, they have me, uh, vitamins or rather components that lack actually in other foods. And uh, some of the vitamins that are very key that lack in other foods are the B vitamins. Uh, when mushrooms are exposed to sunlight, they, they actually absorb uh, vitamin D and they become now a good source of vitamin D. They also uh, have uh, good uh, antioxidants and also some mushrooms, especially the oyster mushrooms, they, uh, they have medicinal value. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, cultivation, the cultivation of mushrooms does not interfere with other forms of, of farming activities. And so it can be integrated and it becomes a sustainable way of recycling waste. The other thing is that it is a short cycle crop that only takes two months between the substrate preparation and harvesting of the mushrooms. The demand for mushroom in Kenya is growing, it's high. And uh, we find that uh, we've been producing uh, less than a ton, whereas the demand for mushrooms is over, uh, uh, over, 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 over a ton per year. The other thing is that mushrooms can be cultivated by, 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 by different uh, groups of people and uh, by, by at any scale that is, at a small scale and even at large scale. And uh, Despite the usefulness of cultivating mushrooms, we find that there are challenges. And some of these challenges are good to address because they are possible, uh, to, it's possible to find a solution. And uh, one of the challenges is the uh, market, market access. And this is brought about because uh, most uh, farmers that we have in Kenya are small scale farmers producing small volumes of mushrooms. And so you find getting, accessing a large market becomes a problem because of uh, sustainable uh, farming. And so this favors, you find now it favors the few large scale farmers, but uh, the solution could be uh, farmers developing our networks and actually uh, working as a marketing as a group. It is happening in Rwanda, so it is possible to happen in Kenya and also uh, it's also an, uh, an opportunity now that uh, entrepreneurs can uh, find so that they buy from farmers and now they sell to actually a bigger market. Um, the other thing is the uh, climate control. And uh, we, we found out that most of the species that we are cultivating in Kenya, they are of uh, exotic origin. And so you find that uh, they lack uh, the adaptability and so we find the cost of production going higher because you have to control the conditions uh, under which uh, or which are suitable or rather which favor the production of the, the growth of these mushrooms. And so we, uh, it is possible for us to domesticate the equivalent wild mushrooms uh, that, are, that are actually, uh, that are, we, are, we are actually, we have actually uh, imported or we are, we are currently uh, cultivating. And also, also coming up with the uh, breeding uh, research programs so that we can uh, uh, breed a, a, a species that are actually specific for the climatic conditions that we have uh, in Kenya. And the other one, the other thing is that farmers lack skills. 
And uh, just like cultivating or rather growing any other crop, it is important, first of all, to gain, to gain skills. The other thing is, is, is important also to have uh, knowledge and information. Uh, because this is because uh, this is a, a sensitive fungus. Mushrooms are actually sensitive, and they require skills. Uh, the other, the, because are also the requirements for mushrooms also differ from other crops. They are delicate to handle, but with the right with the right skills and the right information, then uh, mushroom cultivation is a is a good venture. And so I, I, I would propose that farmer, uh, farmers who are aspiring to do the, the to carry out the activity that they should seek actually uh, connect or rather connect and seek knowledge from experienced farmers. The other thing is that they need also to go to research institutions where uh, mushroom, mushroom, mushroom cultivation uh, is, is, is or rather mushroom research is being carried out and the uh, so that they can be helped and so that they can learn from the experts. And also, we also having uh, the issue of the competitors, and this is coming through imports. As I've said, we are not producing enough mushrooms in the country. And so we need to introduce more farmers uh, into, into, into farming. And uh, the other thing is that uh, when, when, when we are not pro able to produce enough, then we allow our importers such as the uh, uh, Rwanda mushrooms to come in uh, from Kigali farms and uh, for us to mitigate these it is it is it is it is it is now uh, required of us to actually enhance our research and also encourage farmers to do farming then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, different types of mushrooms that are cultivated it is good to highlight uh, some of the processes that uh, go on are the advantages of cultivating these mushrooms even before we go to domesticating our own it is it is it is because uh, we we are going to improve our livelihoods as we carry on our research and one of the species that uh, is the second most cultivated is uh, oyster mushrooms although it, it is uh, becoming also uh, the most uh, cultivated because uh, of uh, so many advantages and one of the advantages is that uh, recently it is it is it is it is gaining acceptance, and this is mainly because of uh, factors like uh, being uh, medicinally uh, uh, superior. Uh, it it is easy it is easy to cultivate. Its spawn is uh, locally available, and materials to, culti to cultivate these uh, species are easily accessible. The other thing is that it is less uh, labor intensive. And uh, the cost of production is a bit lower compared to any other species. And uh, there are requirements now when it comes to cultivating mushrooms, because mushrooms are cultivated indoors. And one of the steps is uh, actually to come up uh, with a mushroom house or mushroom structure. And these ma uh, structures, they, they, they can be uh, constructed uh, using mud using concrete, using bricks. And the, the, the beauty is that a mushroom can be done at any scale, as we said, small or even uh, at large scale. And uh, the second step, this is uh, now uh, the acquisition of the, of the substrates that are required to cultivate uh, uh, mushrooms. And uh, the substrate should be prepared in a way that uh, they are of, of, of good size in terms of the, 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 the pieces that are used. And as, at the same time, this uh, substrate is usually uh, supplemented. And uh, some of the supplements that are normally added to, uh, to the substrates so that uh, we can have a higher yield is uh, like use of wheat bran or the calcium carbonate to regulate the pH the gym sum for conditioning the substrates, uh, which are soaked in water overnight. They are drained well. They are packaged into uh, approved uh, polythene bags and their mouths are closed well before they are, they are now uh, are put into the, into the drum uh, where they are pasteurized. 
Uh, so the that step is a pasteurization, whereby the substrate are now uh, pasteurized. They are pasteurized uh, using uh, a drum, and uh, this drum um, uh, it's, uh, uh, usually has a stand, so that the substrates are above uh, the water levels. And this process takes about four uh, to six hours. And the fourth step is where now spawning comes in. And uh, it is important to ensure that the spawn that is used or the mushroom seed is of good quality because that will determine the yield that you're going to yield to have and also the production. And uh, the other thing is that uh, spawning should be done in a, a clean and sterile environment using uh, uh, equipments that, uh, that have also been sterilized. And uh, the other step is the uh, incubation, that when these uh, mushrooms have been spawned or the substrate has been spawned, they are taken to a room. And this room is called incubation room. And uh, this one is a, is a room that has been prepared with the shelves that have been well sterilized. And uh, so therefore, uh, that room should be clean uh, with the clean circul uh, circulating air. Uh, a low, low intensity is required. And this room should be free of predators, such as right and, rats and mice. We go to the sixth step where by now, when the, that has been accomplished, colonization has taken place in the incubation room and it is complete, holes are made. And uh, this allows now fruiting and uh, also increasing the light in intensity of that incubation room or the, the substrates are transferred to another room. And uh, the moment the mushrooms start fruiting, they usually take two, five, uh, three to five days. And that is between the fruiting and the harvesting. And this harvesting can go on for up to two months. And uh, we also uh, have the other now, the other cultivation now of the other species that we call baton. It has been the most cultivated species, though it's being overtaken by the oyster. And uh, one thing about this species is that uh, it is more marketable. It is consumed by a high, per, a high, per, a high percentage of uh, Kenyan population, and especially uh, in the hotel industry. Uh, these mushrooms have a, a longer shelf life compared, uh, actually compared to any other species. And uh, they are also, the, 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 the challenging thing about uh, the species is that uh, the number of substances required are, uh, are, are more, which actually is not a challenge, it's just a requirement for these species. And then the other thing is that the process of, uh, of, of substrate preparation is a bit uh, longer than the other or involving. Also, it also re uh, requires labor. And uh, the spawn for this uh, species is not yet domestic, uh, it's, it's, it, it's not locally available. So we import a spawn for button mushrooms. And as we said there, it is possible for us to come up with a actually with spawn from uh, mushrooms that are occurring in, uh, occurring in our habitats. And the other thing is that uh, as a result, the cost of production becomes a bit higher, but that is not to discourage farmers from uh, cultivating these species. The beauty of these species is that it also sells uh, the, 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 the cost of this, uh, the, 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 the price for button mushroom is also high. And uh, the process now of cultivating button mushrooms, uh, it is as shown below. Uh, this process takes uh, approximately 21 days. And this is because uh, the compositing of the substrate uh, is a bit higher. And so it requires a turning of the substrate after an interval of uh, every two days. And uh, after that, the, the substrate is taken through a tunnel so that it is uh, posterized, whereby it is spawned. And after spawning, um, the 
substrate is uh, prepared by adding uh, casing soil on the top of the substrate. And this is uh, when it is comp when compared to the oyster mushroom cultivation. Uh, here the forest soil is used. And uh, after a period of time, then you have the fruiting taking place. And the mushrooms are ready now to go for to the next uh, stage. And this next stage now is uh, the seventh step of mushroom cultivation for both species. And this uh, involves the consumption and the commercialization. And uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the, the various outlets uh, where mushrooms are sold. Uh, this is a question that is uh, normally asked by so many farmers, that if you cultivate mushrooms, where are we going to sell them? And uh, some of these uh, uh, market uh, avenues are the supermarkets. Uh, we have our uh, hypermarkets, like the 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 the, the, the village market, and um, we also have the grocery shops. Some most of these uh, shops uh, you find them in Parkland. Some we find them in uh, uh, City Park. Uh, we have hotels, the high end hotels. Uh, we have individuals. And uh, this uh, includes uh, our neighbors, our neighbors, the colleagues at work, the friends, and the family. And the uh, mushroom can actually uh, 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 form a very, 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 very important uh, uh, delicacies, uh, including a, a breakfast. And the uh, the other thing is uh, consuming them with other 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 dishes uh, like rice, uh, ugali. And uh, finally, I want to acknowledge uh, the National Museums of Kenya and the University of Nairobi, and also for the National Geographic Society for uh, funding this work. Kenivo, whom we have worked with in the collection of the world uh, mushrooms that we've been able to culture in our laboratories and they come up actually uh, uh, with the uh, clean mycelium. And finally, I want to conclude uh, by thanking uh, all my viewers. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, Susan. Thank you very much again for that exciting uh, and very encouraging educative presentation. Now, we are going now to the next stage. We have finalized with our presentations. And now is the question and uh, comment sec uh, section or discussion uh, session. So we are going to be led by Dr. Mary Nyawira, who will take us through the questions that you presenters have already written down in the chat section. But we are also going after that to open for open discussion, quick one, where those with the questions can verbally ask them. So Dr. Mary, you can take us through. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all the participants, the presenters for a powerful and inspiring uh, presentation. I think the presentation have been very fruitful and we have several questions. Uh, we have two questions for Dr. Carlos. I think we are going to start with you, Dr. Carlos. Uh, there are people who are asking questions uh, about the eye naturalist. One of them is asking whether it's possible to approach photos observation when they do not have GPS. And in case you, you do that, what will happen? The second question, is asking whether eye naturalist and discover life GBF complement each other. And the other one is about how we can share now what you have presented with the audience. Welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Dr. Mary. Yes, those are very, very important questions. Okay, if 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 you start uploading observations with 
no location, maybe, maybe your cell phone doesn't have GPS, your camera doesn't have GPS, or even if it has like GPS and you have the coordinates, sometimes when you're, when you're using the cell phone, uh, it doesn't get the signal from the GPS and the photograph doesn't have location. If you upload that, it won't show on any part of the world. I mean, it doesn't have, I naturally doesn't have any way to actually locate that, that observations. But the good news is that you can add location manually. We did that kind of uh, exercise when I was uploading on the web page. None of my photographs have uh, had uh, location. So I just went there and manually I zoom it in into my, my local area and I just click on the area as, as far as I, you can recognize little details on the, on the map. So you can change, edit or move your, your location. So don't worry if you have, maybe you have all photographs, you can upload all photographs. You just need to remember where you took those one. It doesn't have to be like precise, exact point. You can maybe just, oh, I remember that I was walking in this area, this mountain. Maybe I was just taking a, uh, a visit to a local park. And I remember that I was around here. You can change that manually. So don't worry if your GPS was not turned on or it, even if it was turned on, it didn't record the location because you can edit or change the location manually. But it's very, very important that the observation have the location, time and date, and the evidence. This being meaning the photograph or the sound. So don't worry if, if you don't have photographs with location, you can change, you can edit that on, you can do that on the web page and you can do that also on the cell phone. So don't worry about that. And I hope that covers the first question. And the second question, that's, that's also really important. <clears throat> Maybe new users sometimes don't realize how important it is that they actually take pictures from any organism. It, it can be, birds, plants, fungi, whatever. When you, those observations jump from casual to research grade level, yes, they can go to GBIF or discover life. Actually, there is a, a huge amount of, of information of already onto, <clears throat> I'm sorry, onto GBIF from research grade observations. This is very important for researchers, for scientists, because they have already used them to publish papers. And, and I think we covered this on the previous session. Uh, I think, uh, George, you can, if you can access the other, the other, uh, the other presentation, the previous sessions, you can, you can see a little more detailed information. But yes, there's an important, iNaturalist is an important source of information for GBIC and also for Discover Life. So that's another uh, good thing of participating in this kind of, of initiatives. Remember, this is a worldwide initiative. This is not just an isolated community. This is a growing community of people interested in documenting and knowing about biodiversity in their local areas. I hope those, those cover it. The, the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Carlos, for good and positive answers. I hope the people who have asked the questions, they are satisfied, and I know they are satisfied because you have answered them well. Susan, we have two, three questions for you. So you are the next one to address these questions. One of the concerns is some agricultural waste, uh, waste that are used in mushroom cultivation are contaminated with herbicides, pesticide. How do we deal with that? The other question is, how can we prolong the self life of mushroom after harvesting? Because it's a big problem, uh, especially when the farmers harvest and they do not have markets. And maybe you can also speak on the storage ways and methods and how much you do you expect when you cultivate mushroom. 
Susan. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nevira. And uh, I want to start by answering the first question. And uh, uh, I would want to say that uh, it is true that uh, the substitutes that are used are, act are actually from the crops that have been sprayed, uh, and especially pesticides and uh, herbicides. Uh, but I want to say that uh, if there's a crop that actually is uh, grown hygienically, it is mushrooms. Because uh, the beauty with mushrooms is that they are not sprayed. And uh, the methods that are actually are used uh, during the process of uh, substrate preparation, they actually, because what we, we, we realize is that, uh, in, in fact, if we have uh, an issue of uh, pesticides, an issue of uh, herbicides, it is actually, uh, it could be uh, the residues. And uh, in most cases, you, we find that uh, after the crop has been harvested, there's normally that period between the harvest of the crop and actually when the substrate uh, is being used. And, and I, I, would, I would want to say that uh, when we come now to the processes of, of preparing the substrate, and, the, and one of them is soaking the substrate for 48 hours, if you have done that, you realize that uh, when you, you remove the substrate from the water, let's say, for example, it is wheat straw, you find that the water has changed color from the, its original uh, colorless uh, form to actually black or something. And so for me, I find it uh, the, as, as a way of cleaning uh, the substrate and uh, eliminating some of these uh, uh, residues that probably could have uh, remained behind. So the method that is used for mushroom uh, uh, farming uh, becomes very key, by the way, in cleaning even of the substrate. Then remember, there's the step now of uh, pasteurizing this substrate. It's, it's usually uh, under, uh, under steam, whereby you find that uh, I understand, I'm not a chemist, but uh, I would want to imagine that uh, some of these uh, compounds uh, get broken down. And so finally, you find that uh, even if you have something that goes to the mushroom, actually it could be very, very minimal. And even as we know of the vegetables that we take, the fruits, you find that there are those allowable levels. And for me, I would say that uh, if at all there's a crop that uh, would have least of the residues uh, are mushrooms. Then uh, I will go to the next question. And this is on how you can uh, uh, prolong the shelf life of mushrooms. Uh, one thing I want to say about mushrooms is that uh, mushrooms are 90% water. And so uh, the best way uh, to, pro to, to actually keep them for long is just uh, refrigerating them and actually not for long about three days. The other methods that are, have been used are uh, drying, mush, drying them and actually uh, selling them in dry form. Uh, there are also other methods whereby uh, value can be added into the mushrooms so that they can be consumed uh, in the most organic way uh, possible. Then uh, uh, Dr. Mary, can I, can I, can I, can I can I get the other question? Dr. Nyawira? Okay, thank you, Susan. The other question is expectant yields of the mushroom, especially when the farmers now begin to grow the mushroom, how much do they expect? Then I think I'll add you another one. There's somebody who'd like to know in case they want collaboration, how can they go about that? Welcome, Susan. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. And the, the expected yield, uh, I would want to say that uh, it, it depends with the species. And uh, the other thing is that uh, our industry is still young. And so we, we find that uh, the competition is not high. And so we find that for oyster, the minimum of uh, price that one can sell is a hundred shillings. But when you look at the cost, let's say for example, the input, uh, it's usually less than uh, 50 shillings. 
for for that for that particular uh let's say two two k two kg bag so you're likely to get if everything is contact, constant and uh, if uh, all things are or rather if the process is done well then it is possible for you to get twice a uh, profit to what you had uh, you had put in and uh, if that is not the case then you find that uh, at least okay for mushroom you cannot go go go, go wrong on profits and uh, that is why i'm saying let's say for example there's some uh, challenges here and there then uh, you have to make a uh, 50% of what you are put in then when it comes to collaborations uh, as at the national museums of kenya uh, we carry out research on mushrooms uh, we advise farmers on the cultivation we advise them for on, on on the practices we advise them on the processes uh we actually even link them with the farmers who have been in the in the industry for a, a long period of time uh, farmers who are credible farmers who are known to us the other thing is that uh, we ensure that uh, we make a quality uh, mushroom spawn and uh, as I said, when I was uh, giving the presentation, I said that uh, spawn is one of the things that should be put into consideration when one uh, want to do uh, mushroom cultivation, and that is the source of the seed, which should be quality. Actually, it should be a very, very high quality uh, because actually that is a seed. Is the seed for the cultivation and if you fail on the seed, and if you fail on the process, then you'll fail in mushroom cultivation. Uh, Dr. Anyawera, I hope I have answered all the questions. Okay, thank you, Susan, for the good answers. And I hope the, the, those who have asked the question, they are now satisfied with the, the answers. And in case you have any question, any communication, we have shared the emails of all the presenters. You can speak to us. You can ask all the questions we need. We have also shared the email of the project. So those ones in need of collaboration, we, you can talk to us through the email. You can contact us and we'll be able to formulate the way we can collaborate together. And I'm sure we are going to go we are going to move forward and we are going to make mushroom research successful so i think that's all for now thank you very much for coming thank you for listening and thank you for participating we look forward for another time when we can share together okay thank you very much i can see in the chat section there are a number of questions that are still streaming in and uh, like Dr. Mary have said, because of time, we are requesting that uh, uh, you can be able now to link directly to the presenters. If you go back to the chat section, we have shared the email address for all the presenters. So for collaboration, for further uh, queries and comments, I'm sure we can be able to do that. Unless maybe there is one participant with a burning one, so that we can also hear from you. We want also in case one can unmute and ask a question, still free. Otherwise, just put the questions in the chat section and then link. We we'll link you with the, for the answers with the, uh, the presenters. So I don't know, one last one, who would want to talk? Just unmute and just a question or a comment from the presenters. Just unmute. Then uh, we hear from you. Otherwise, because of time, I can see people are contented with the chat. They have written uh, questions and comments there. So we are going to link you with the presenters. Again, you can be able straight away right to the, our presenters. Our emails are already in the chat section, even for the first sellers. In case you had some question, again, you can still do the same. So because of time, I want us now to go to the 
our last section or session, that is the closing remarks. We expected to have this Dr. Teresa Yonando. She's the director of our National Geographical Society, but she had a sick talent. She quickly learned to handle that. So I'm going to, on her behalf, uh, do the final uh, closing remarks on her behalf. That is on behalf of uh, Dr. Teresa. So my name is Dr. Mushai. I work for the, uh, from the University of Nairobi, uh, Department of uh, Clinical Studies, but specifically uh, wildlife section. So I wish to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this webinar, in particular, the National Museums of Kenya and also the University of Nairobi. And also, the National Geographical Society for funding the project. On behalf of everyone here today, I wish to thank our presenters for making time in your busy schedule to speak to us today and uh, for the outstanding presentations that you made today. Thank you very much. We are also indebted to the University of Nairobi who hosted the two webinar series. In particular, we recognize the assistance offered by Mr. Nicholas Owino, who is the head of ICT department at the University of Nairobi. Thank you very much. Finally, on behalf of the University of Nairobi, the National Museums of Kenya, the National Geographical Society and Kenvo, who are the volunteer organization, and uh, in particular, recognizing Stephen Kamau, who has been taking lead there. I would like to pay my deep respect to all you participants and to express our appreciation to you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules and duties to attend the two webinar series. We thank you very much. We appreciate your keen interest in mushroom research, mushroom conservation, and also sustainable utilization of this key uh, biodiversity. And we hope that what you have learned through the two webinar series will help you a lot as citizen scientists first and foremost, and also as mushroom farmers or entrepreneurs. So in case there are question, questions and queries, we still have uh, our numbers and our email. You can be able to link with us to even uh, uh, develop deeper uh, partnership in this. As we had promised, all participants will get a certificate of participation. So this will be sent to you next week after they have been uh, made uh, through the emails, your email. Your, we, we have all your emails, so we'll do that through the emails. So I would encourage you all to remain engaged like uh, our presenters have said, and especially by submission and in identification. So for lo, all those of us who now are expert in uh, mushroom identification, so we do that, especially of the mushroom species in the iNaturalist, and continue to contribute to macrofungi research and conservation in your different ways, and also in sustainable utilization. So we look forward to interacting with you in future. So this is not the end of it all. So we continue, let's continue interacting. So for more information, we have our project email again on chat section. So Dr. Mary, make sure that's there. We also have our, where our project YouTube. Again, uh, Dr. Mary has put that in our chat section and also our Facebook because we are going to put all the presentation there and also questions and answers there in the Facebook and also the videos in the YouTube. 
so that we can be able to interact, continue interacting uh, online. I know with a few, those few remarks, we are going to call it a day. And thank you very much for your attention and uh, may God bless you. So thank you very much. Otherwise, in case of anything, we will continue to hear from you. Antony Sana, thank you very much. Good, thank you. So now in case there is anyone with anything, there's still some one or two minutes, we are still open and then we can leave the webinar at our own pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, and see you later. Thank you, too. Thank you all. It's been a nice session. Bye.